What's up everyone, it's Michael here with Offshore Citizen. Now, I've been in the offshore business for almost 10 years now, doing building structures and international tax planning for people and forming companies and opening bank accounts and trusts and asset protection, all these different things. And over that time, lots has changed. And one of the things I consistently see is there's a lot of old information on the internet that people are still following. So you may go and check out a blog article, you may check out some forum posts, you may check out what somebody is saying or what service provider is offering, and it's outdated information very often. And the problem with that is that when you have that, you know, you could be doing something illegal, you could be putting yourself in a situation where your money's at risk, you could be putting yourself in a situation where the privacy that you think you have, you don't actually have, you can be wasting a bunch of money because it's ineffective, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So today, I'm gonna to talk to you specifically about what has changed in the time that I've been viewing this business and how things are now as a contrast and therefore what you should be doing differently in order to kind of navigate these waters and get the solution that you would best like because let's be honest, lots has changed. So. Let's dive in. If you haven't already, please smash the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, the all notifications so you don't miss out on any of our videos. If you'd like help with these subjects of international tax planning, forming companies, opening bank accounts, getting residencies, citizenship, second passports, uh, asset protection, all those things, please reach out to me. You can book a call, calendu.com forward slash Michael dash Rosmer. There's a link in the description below or send a message to our websites, offshorecitizen.net and offshorecapitalist.com. Okay. So rewind back approximately 10 years. What was the situation? Well, offshore meant traditional tax havens to most people, okay? In other words, the majority of the companies, I think there was 625,000 companies formed in British Virgin Islands, right? So British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, Anguilla, Marshall Islands, Samoa, Vanuatu, Liberia, etc. These were places where you would form companies most of the time. You had, to some extent, uh, banking in places like Cayman Islands, Bahamas, St. Vincent, uh, uh, Malta, you know, so you opened bank accounts in Malta back then. Uh, let's see here, where else? Lebanon, Cyprus, places like this, right? These were all places that you would uh, form banks. And really, you know, about 10 years ago was kind of the peak ideal time, I would say, for a lot of the offshore stuff. And the reason for this is, if you go back, offshore really started to emerge as a thing I would say around the 80s. And the problem in the 80s was that, you know, how do you contact these banks? How do you contact these service providers? How do you do anything, right? Doing things remotely was difficult, it was expensive. Imagine calling long distance down to Cayman Islands, even just identifying like what are the phone numbers? You'd probably have to fly down there, go and meet with people in person, kind of difficult, right? So that was a challenge. Now what happened really kind of like I said, around 2010-ish was you had the advent of the smartphone becoming popular. Suddenly, internet was permeating at pretty high speeds around a lot more of the world. It was possible to be more location independent. And it just really opened up a lot of opportunities for people to take advantage of. So yes, prior to that, you know, Apple's original corporate structure uh, that they were using in Ireland, the very famous uh, Dutch sandwich with the... Uh, or double Irish with the Dutch sandwich uh, structure, et cetera, goes back to, uh, I think, like 1980 or something like that. But, you know, if you weren't a huge company like that, you couldn't take advantage of it. For normal people, for people like who would typically be our clients, et cetera, online entrepreneurs, et cetera, really around 10 years ago was kind of that peak time. And it was, things were pretty easy for people who wanted to go and do it at that time for a couple different reasons. One, it was very opaque, right? It was difficult for uh, governments to get information about what was going on. Things functioned relatively well. Realistically, a lot of the banking worked about as well through an offshore bank as it did through an onshore bank, and I'll talk about that in a minute and how that's changed. Then uh, the tax rules were not as sophisticated. So although some of them uh, certainly still were fairly tough, uh, enforcement was a lot more difficult, et cetera. And, so, you know, that led to simple solutions. We innovated back then by doing things like, you know, using Anguilla instead of British Virgin Islands because the laws were slightly better and it was a cheaper, faster, easier process, right? So, you know, some of these places that people hadn't heard as much about, oh, Seychelles was really back, big back then, uh, Belize, IBCs, et cetera. And nowadays, we hardly use any of those things, hardly ever. 
So what changed? Well, I would argue that principally it started around 2009 when UBS was taken down by uh, the US government. The US government went after them uh, for facilitating uh, tax evasion on behalf of their clients. Uh, that was kind of the first break in Swiss bank secrecy, which had been really strong up to that point in time. Then they followed it up in 2011 with Credit Suisse, the second largest Swiss bank, and then in 2013, all the Swiss banks. So that was like the end of Swiss bank secrecy. There still was Andorra at the time, there still was Lebanon, there's still a few of these holdouts, et cetera. But uh, that was kind of the beginning of the end where the US figured out how they could provide international pressure on these secrecy jurisdictions in order to uh, yeah, just kind of like go around their, their laws. And so we saw follow-ups of this, uh, Banca Privada in Andorra ended up being named a principal money laundering concern and shut out of the US financial system and taken over by the Central Bank of Andorra and it took years to kind of process through all that. You had uh, the Cyprus banks had issues, you had a bunch of issues with banks in St. Vincent, you had Caledonian Bank in uh, Cayman Islands, uh, et cetera. You had a bunch of the banks in Malta suffer issues, et cetera, et cetera, right? There was a lot of, uh, a lot of different problems that came out of there. And so that really changed the game because suddenly banks started to become more restrictive. Okay? That was, I think, like the first thing that happened. Now, realistically, the real trigger point, I would say, where I noticed banks becoming especially restrictive was around 2015 when they brought in FATCA, which was the U.S. Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, which today is still there. Basically, what the U.S. government did was they made every bank globally a tax collector for the IRS. They required that all the banks would disclose information about all U.S. customers around the world. And the penalty was, if they didn't do that, they would automatically have 30% deducted from any transactions uh, in U.S. dollars that would all have to flow through the U.S. And so that was a pretty big stick that they went after them with. And from there, that resulted in, uh, first of all, bilateral agreements. A lot of the countries said, hey, hey, this isn't really fair. It should be mutual information exchange. And so they started to agree to that. And then this was followed up by the OECD uh, launching the common reporting standard and automatic exchange of information, which basically has been signed by pretty much every country in the world, at least every country you would want to bank in. And so what changed in this? Well, one of the big things that changed was it went from company secrecy mattering to banks mattering. So up till that point in time, you could often form companies with no KYC and you could open bank accounts with very little information really easily. And because of that, it was like, great, try and come to Vanuatu and get the information. Like, how would they get the information? This is one of the things that people would say back then. They would say, you know, hey, well, what's the problem with me doing something? How are they gonna find out? And you know, I'd have to point out to them, hey, listen, you know, people didn't think that they would find out with Swiss banks, but then they took down UBS. And so do you want to be in that situation where you think you're solid today and it's like better off to do it legally now? Because a lot of people who, uh, basically what had happened in that situation was if you had an undisclosed Swiss bank account, they just took a portion of the money, assuming that it was tax evasion, whether it was valid or not. I was like, well, you could have done everything legally and not had that issue. So, you know, you should do the same. Anyway, uh, yeah, back then it was like, great, good luck, come to Samoa, come to Vanuatu. And the laws had been built specifically for secrecy purposes, specifically to try and keep people out. And that was like how countries were competing. Countries were competing on cost and secrecy. But suddenly, all these banks would take your information anyway. So it was like, okay, all the banks, there was no numbered accounts anymore. You had, I think the last people actually to have numbered accounts really was Lebanon. Lebanon was kind of the last holdout. And there was like fancy ways that you had to get around in order to do that if you wanted to. And suddenly uh, the Swiss banks didn't want to deal with all these people because they said, you know, for example, I think it was UBS had paid like 700 million, 900 million, something like that in, I think it was 900 million in fines uh, to the US. Uh, Credit Suisse had paid, I think it was 2.4 billion. And then there was various deals across two or 300 uh, other remaining Swiss banks. And so they basically all said, hey, we don't want to take this risk on. Like $2.4 billion fine, not worth it. Thank you very much. We'll, uh, we'll see you later. And so that was this ripple effect that happened. It started to become much more difficult to get bank accounts. And you also had to expect that uh, your bank information would be disclosed. And so what was kind of like the immediate outfall of that? 
Uh, the immediate outfall of that from the banking side of things was people started looking for places that weren't sharing information, right? They would go to places like Georgia, and Georgia kind of marketed themselves as, hey, we're not a CRS jurisdiction. Arguably a really bad idea. I was just talking to a client um, the other day about Sri Lanka and you know, some of the things they've done. And I was like, okay, you know, those things look positive in the short term, but who's that going to attract and what are the consequences of that going to be over time, right? Similar what you saw with places like um, Cyprus, right? Cyprus made it really easy and the result was, you know, they opened themselves up to a lot of risk, which we eventually saw with FBME being shut down and a bunch of issues around that whole issue. So those are, those are like some core problems that developed. And so how did that change, uh, how did that change strategy? Well, first of all, we started to say, okay, banks in a lot of these smaller jurisdictions become risky. What we saw was, you know, you could have a bank account at a bank that seemed okay, and suddenly that bank got shut off from the US monetary system, and great, you had your account, you had your money there, but you couldn't transfer it anywhere. There was nothing you could do. And as a result, you know, what use is it to you? How does that affect your business if suddenly all your savings are suddenly frozen, right? It's a big deal, right? The thing that, kind of the outfall of that was, okay, in addition to looking for places that uh, you had that you, know, you could actually open accounts for, <laughs> novelty. Uh, you also needed to be in a situation where you could uh, rely on much more stability. So you started to look more at jurisdictions like Hong Kong, like uh, Singapore, like, I mean, to some extent you still have, even to this day, Switzerland. In fact, Switzerland has also arguably come back a bunch. Uh, you would look at places like maybe Isle of Man, Jersey. Again, those are there, but you know, in sort of a different way. Uh, th things like this, right? Uh, at the same time, we started to pay more and more attention to things like e-commerce, uh, payment processing started to matter more, et cetera, so you had to factor that in. Uh, we had a little period of using Gibraltar a lot. We really liked Gibraltar because it was great for payment processing, it was great for taxes, it was great for, uh, we could still do banking with it, et cetera, a bunch. So it was really attractive jurisdiction. And then that ended up getting kind of flipped and we had, uh, Gibraltar kind of became one of these ones that was like, okay, now you couldn't really use Gibraltar to get bank accounts anymore. So banking just became like a, one of the main primaries. At kind of the same time, what happened was you had uh, an increasing amount of attention being given to uh, various tax rules. Now, there had been things like controlled foreign companies rules for in the US. They were originally created subpart F of the US tax code in the 70s when they did tax reform. Uh, but there was a lot of holes in subpart F, and so it was pretty pretty weak. Uh, they'd introduced gradually various different exceptions and things like that. Other countries were a little bit tougher, but still, you know, not that sophisticated. Uh, you had management control rules, uh, but again, it was harder to figure out where it was going on there, so it was harder to enforce. As there was more transparency, as you know, every country was reporting, etc., it became more of an issue. And I would say that that really started to also trigger people's desire to move more. Prior to that point in time, you didn't really have to be as focused on moving. You could take advantage of just kind of like working through the holes. And it started to become more and more difficult to, uh, to stay in their country and take advantage of those holes. So that was something. Now, uh, from there, what we started to see was things like the EU introduced the Anti-Tax Avoidance Directive, right? So the move started to become more towards substance, all right? In other words, they didn't like the idea there'd be like exposés, documentaries, journalistic reports on, look at this place in British Virgin Islands where 2,000 companies are listed at this address and it's basically just post office boxes, right? And so the idea of where's the substance became more and more important, right? And banks were looking at that too because banks were under pressure. So we had this kind of coalescence of wanting to figure out, okay, where can we put a company? that we can also have people, that we can also have banking and try to bring that together. At least try to bring together where the company and the bank account was. Prior to then, if we were to go back, we had this concept of flag theory. And it was like, you wanted to have separate bank account companies in separate jurisdictions as the bank accounts, which were separate from the owners. And we'd have multiple layers. And so it'd be like, you had a whole, uh, an operating company in one jurisdiction, and that's jurisdiction A, and then bank account in jurisdiction B, and then holding company in jurisdiction C, and holding company's bank account in jurisdiction D, and then maybe a trust, and that was in jurisdiction E, and then trust bank account in jurisdiction F. Like you had this process that had to be followed through. And that really became no longer viable. 
it was extremely difficult to try and spread these things out because there's just a limited number of options in places that you could get these. And in order to have stability, uh, to have a working structure that would be functional on an ongoing basis, you pretty much wanted to have the company in the same place as the bank account where possible. Now to this day, we do, do separate those out a bunch, but not to the point where, hey, we can have these multiple layers with bank accounts, et cetera, all over the place. You often are pretty limited in that regard. So that was a pretty, uh, a pretty big departure. And this made more expensive jurisdictions more attractive. So places like, well, we had moved from Originally, I used to tell people, because they would get sold some Hong Kong structure, I'd say, why would you want a Hong Kong structure? They have annual audited financial reporting. That's like, you know, what a pain in the ass. It doesn't make sense. But now all of a sudden, Hong Kong, I was like, okay, well, you can get an HSBC account, you can get a Hang Seng account, you can get an OCBC account, etc. This seems like a better option. Uh, banks in Singapore are more comfortable with these uh, Hong Kong companies than they are with companies from Gibraltar or Seychelles or something like that. And so that makes a difference. So all these things played into uh, what was viable in this scenario. And you know that was perfectly fair, I guess. That it kind of was, was the development, right? That was just how we had to work with it. But it made places like UAE more attractive because you know UAE, pretty expensive place to get set up, right? You're typically talking around 10 grand to go through the setup process. There's a lot of stuff around it. It was like, okay, well, why did you want to pay 10 grand when you could pay, you know, a thousand bucks to form a company in Belize or something like that, right? Okay, there's a little bit more to it than that, but anyway, that was that was one of the big things. So, you know, this was a new departure. We needed to start paying attention to banking, then we need to pay attention to stability. So, like to this day, when we form structures for people, I always tell them minimum two bank accounts, ideally three bank accounts. We don't. We always want you to have a backup. And people who have never done this before don't really get. Hey, your bank account could get closed down really easily. And I'll see some people read reviews and they'll say, hey, you know, I'm not sure about this bank, you know, they shut people's accounts down. It's like everybody shuts people's accounts down today. That's like the reality. Um, if you're, it, yeah, it's just very easy to have happen. You could be, you know, a Canadian living in Canada and get it shut down. You could get, you could be a American living in the US and get your account shut down and so on and so forth, just depending on the type of activity you're doing and things like this. And banks don't really understand what your situation is. So that's another issue. We started to put together like business plans and proposals and you know we would list out pictures with you know, the bank could see what the product was and what the websites were and all this and we'd submit that to the bank as this package that they could look at and understand what was going on because it wasn't clear to them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So these things were all relevant to the changes. Now, I would say that what became kind of uh, the big deal on the tax side aside from looking at this substance, was a lot more countries started to tighten up uh, the situation with respect to uh, your, uh, uh, like there's, there's CFC rules and there are, there are other related rules. So for example, when the Anti-Tax Avoidance Directive came in, one of the rules was that all the countries in the EU had to adopt CFC rules. They all had to adopt exit tax. They all had to adopt these various different things. And so that was a little bit, uh, it kind of removed some of the places. What I saw a lot of people doing was saying, hey, you know what, I'd rather pay a little bit of tax. I kind of want to pay some tax so that I can show that, you know, I'm here paying some tax, that's it. And that made places like Bulgaria more popular. That made places like Labuan more popular, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, literally, uh, I know of people who have left UAE because they wanted to go to some place where they could say they were paying tax because there was, you know, in some cases, backlash by customers, right? You had that in UK where uh, I think it was Starbucks had people protesting because Starbucks wasn't paying any tax in UK and they said, hey, hey, we'll pay some tax in UK just to kind of make that up. These were kind of the, it was the public pressure that has grown over the, the last number of years and has made a difference. The thing that then has gotten layered on top of that, in addition to just like growing compliance on the bank side and growing complexity of the tax rules, which I would say principally revolve around CFC rules, residency rules, uh, in particular corporate residency rules, like they've done a lot, say in the case of Australia, there's kind of some anti-avoidance rules, a lot more general anti-avoidance, a lot more, like they have the diverted profit tax in UK. Uh, there's a bunch of anti-deferral regimes in uh, Australia, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a bunch of countries adopted blacklists. They started to say, you know, if you're not in one of these countries, then 
there's an issue, hey, if you're you know, dealing with a country that's a low tax country, then there's a different set of rules and if it's below a certain threshold, et cetera. So a lot of this was problematic, right? And what it meant was we ended up building structures a lot more, and this is, you know, to this day, we often a lot more will build in what we might call mid-shore jurisdictions. So mid-shore jurisdictions are ones that are, they're low tax, they're favorable, they're maybe good for business, but they're not zero tax. Uh, maybe they're, you know, they're places where like, it's a real country, it's not just some island. In fact, mostly we do little to nothing on these islands anymore. Uh, there's you know, very rare exceptions to that. The other thing that got introduced, of course, was crypto. And so suddenly you had this situation where all kinds of people were making tons of money in the space, and it's a whole different type of planning because you have different rules related to uh, income than you do to capital gains, right? And that created another, another wave of concerns. And then banks don't understand it, they can't identify source of funds, they're not comfortable with it, et cetera, et cetera. And that's layering another, another degree of complexity onto, uh, onto the whole thing. So in general, that's kind of what has happened uh, over time. So basically what I would say is we've moved from this pure tropical offshore to a lot more what we might call midshore. We've gone from people setting up structures and you know basically just falling between the in the cracks and holes and you know what they can keep opaque to people moving to countries where it's more optimal for them and i think that's probably going to be a trend that will continue i think that more and more people choose to not use banks at all we're starting to see this a lot where people say hey i've got a lot, bunch of wealth in crypto and i'm just going to keep it there i'm not going to bring it into fiat i've got enough money in fiat maybe you're running an internet business or uh, affiliate business or something like that and you know you have a bunch of money in crypto as well and you're like well you know I have a few hundred thousand a few million in fiat that's really all I need I'm just gonna keep the crypto thing going and you know reinvest and grow that and then at some point you know you can buy things with crypto right there's a bunch of places now where you can buy with Bitcoin or you can buy with um, sometimes USDT etc uh, you can interact with more and more people in that regard and probably over the next 10 years that number will increase pretty dramatically so those are some of the factors that we've noticed definitely have uh, changed over the last while. Uh, I think that far too many people do not really understand the nuances of corporate residency rules, and in particular, those in CFC rules, these two tend to, sometimes people confuse the two, and they certainly don't really understand what those are and the implications of those. I get a lot of people who talk to me about this. And then they don't really understand just how challenging banking has become and how much you need to work around that. And then if your business includes things like payment processing, et cetera, kind of the layers around that. However, what has happened is the U.S. has grown more and more as kind of a, a tax haven. We've seen the rise of these digital banks. I would say that a few years ago, I was deeply concerned by a bunch of them. Uh, I'm not as concerned anymore. A lot more of them are pretty well regulated. A lot more of them are uh, dealing directly with the central bank and getting their banking services there. So that's become an increasingly viable way to go. In fact, in a lot of cases, the only way to go for certain types of businesses. So yeah, those are the, uh, the highlights for you. So if you have questions, put them in the comments below. Uh, if you have memories from you know, back when things were easy, put them in the comments below. And I'm gonna look forward to seeing you guys on the next video.